Today's story is super convoluted. Two southern rappers that formed a duo called Filled Mob and were supposed to take over the rap scene. They dropped a couple of successful albums, but after a while they just kinda disappeared. They also had an intense beef with Ludacris. Today we're gonna be discussing the rap duo known as Filled Mob. What up guys, Ali here and welcome to Ali Talks Music. Add me on Instagram at Ali Talks Music as well. And don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. Now let's get into the video. I want to start off by saying the duo had multiple names in addition to their birth names. So for introduction purposes, one half of Field Mob was composed of Sean Timothy Johnson who also went by the name Sean J and Collage, while the other half consisted of Darian Crawford who also went by the names Smoke, Boondocks Black and Chevy P. For the sake of simplicity, I'm just gonna go with Smoke and Sean J. Both rappers grew up in Albany, Georgia, a few blocks away from each other in a poor rural area commonly nicknamed the Field by Locals. The duo met in school and became fast friends in the most unlikely of ways. Smoke challenged Sean, the reigning king of their school's rap battles. I went to a school called Monroe. Sean and them used to have freestyle sessions at Monroe in the courtyard. I heard Sean freestyling and just destroying everybody and I was like, I can do that. I sound just as good as he does, so I tried it. I battled him and I was victorious. And the next day he was victorious, and the next day I was. And it went back and forth like that for a while. It had gotten so popular that folks would come to school just to see us battle. Then one day Sean called me up. I don't know how he got my number. And he was like, man it would be better if we weren't apart. Let's form a group together and voila. This was around 1995 to 1996. The group continued to hustle their butts off to make a career, something that was very difficult based on the area they lived in. There were rappers that came before us, you know, from our city that we, that are legendary, we consider, you know what I mean? So, you know, they didn't make it. So we felt like, you know, let's see. It didn't really bite me in my ass until we was in New York and I see myself on 106 ball, <laughs> <laughs> it was like, oh man, but it was, it, being from down there, you know what I mean, where your mentality is, you know, uh, maybe, if, probably, you know what I mean, I might can do it, you, you know, I gotta have a plan B, cause, you know what I mean, it's the, that, that, that that frequency, that mentality down there, that was, that's what we had. You feel what I'm saying? And it's still going. That 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 level of thinking is still going on down there. You know what I mean? That's why a lot of them can't make it out because they they feel like it's impossible. You feel what I'm saying? <laughs> so coming from that, it was hard to grasp. You know what I mean? Because we still had that. Is this shit real? Like I used to be waking up and they see if this shit. Am I, am I really smoke a field mob? <laughs> <laughs> They chose the name Field Mob for their duo, paying homage to their neighborhood. The duo kept hustling and performing, and around 1999, they managed to get signed to a small independent label called Southern House Records. While there, they recorded the singles Project Dreams and The Dirty. They even bought a little minivan and went on a small tour to promote their new songs. Lucky for them. Southern music was on the rise, thanks to artists like Master P who was at the height of his success at the time. As a result, many labels were looking for an artist similar to Master P and soon their singles caught the attention of Benny Poe of MCA Records. Days later, a deal was inked and signed and Field Mob became the very first Southern hip hop act to be signed to a New York based label under MCA. And so, at the very young age of 19, the young men finally had the backing they needed to become the major stars they dreamed of. Around 2000, Field Mob dropped their very first album, MCA 613, Ashy to Classy, preceded by the single, Project Dreams. The album received a lot of praise, and was even compared to Goody Mob and Outkast. Commercially, the album was not so successful. It came in at number 194 on the Billboard 200 and it sold about 200,000 copies. Undeterred, the duo then began working on their next project. 
They continued to promote their debut album and even got approached by other impressive acts like Trick Daddy, Big Boy, and Outkast. Of the three, Trick Daddy made it to their second album, but they also had features from the likes of CeeLo Green, Trina, and Cocaine. Sadly, the boys wound up getting too involved in the lifestyle, and around 2002, Smoke wound up in some very hot water. After running a red light, Smoke was stopped by police, and when he was searched, the cops found out that he was driving on a suspended license, and he also had cocaine in his pocket. Smoke was arrested, but after paying a bond of $3,700, he got released just in time for Field Mop's next album. Their second album titled From the Ruta to the Tuta was preceded by the single Sick of Being Lonely in the second week of August. It became one of their most popular songs to date, peaking at number 18 on the Hot 100. Following Sick of Being Lonely's success, their next album dropped and performed reasonably well. It peaked at number 33 on the Billboard 200 and sold about 700,000 copies, gaining a gold certification from the RIAA. Another single was released from the album called All I Know with CeeLo Green, but still, it did not perform very well. All I know. At this point, things were looking really good for Field Mob until Universal Music Group, who just so happened to be RCA's parent company, decided to phase out the label around 2003. While their music catalogs were soon absorbed into Geffen Records, the future of the duo was looking mighty grim. They remained signed but would not be prioritized by the label. Luckily, fate was on their side. After the situation was brought to the attention of Ludacris, he decided to sign the duo to Disturbing the Peace. They were signed around 2005, something Smoke could not be happier about. I went free with my creativity at DTP. I was over at MCA, aka Rape You Records. Ludacris let me say what I wanna say. If I wanna say shit, goddammit, motherfucker. He cool with it cause he trusts my creativity. I never knew our CEO at MCA Records. I never got to talk to him. But Luda, I smoke Buddha with Luda. I sip Chris with Chris. We're friends more than business partners, I'd like to say. Before the signing, however, the mob were involved in even more controversy this time helped by Sean J. In a strange turn of events, Sean disappeared off the face of the planet around 2004. Not too strange, but two months later, around September of the same year, he got arrested for kidnapping in Atlanta. Sean had decided to go on the run with a six-month-old baby that he claimed to have fathered. While in custody, Sean refused to disclose the location of the baby. The case was unresolved in the public eye, but I think it's safe to say that he returned the kid since he was not in jail for very long. Now, despite Sean's weird mental break around 2004, Smoke was still the resident bad boy of the group. And two months after signing to DTP around 2005, he was in a courtroom once more. He had been held since mid-October for violating his probation. After a month of being held, he was denied bond and ordered by the court to serve 45 days in jail with credit for his time served as well as 8 days of public service. With both rappers once more firmly on their career paths, at the end of 2005, they both made appearances on the label's collab album, Ludacris Presents Disturbing the Peace. They appeared on a song called Georgia and let's just say that song was a smash. Now, of course, as growing artists, they had to experience some sort of controversy, which for them came in the form of a video. Around 2006, a supposedly leaked video showing Field Mob dissing Jay-Z and Nas and challenging them to rap battles came out. When the video came out, a lot of people were confused. But according to Field Mob, the cameraman had edited the clips to make it look like Field Mob was trying to go at Jay-Z and Nas. The cameraman was later fired. DTP fired him from being a cameraman, so what he did was take his footage home and try to slander us with the footage. And he chopped it up and edited it like we were cracking on New York. By the end of 2006, Sean J and Smoke were promising rappers who were expected to put out a platinum selling album. They even made a go of it when they finally dropped their third album Light Pulse and Pine Trees. And this came after multiple delays. The album was their first release through DTP and received a lot of promo and push from the label, including several promotional singles. 
The album was highly acclaimed and became their highest charting album to date, peaking at number 7 on the Billboard 200. The album's leading single, So What, featuring Sierra, was a massive hit for the group and came in at number 10 on the Hot 100. Unfortunately, this was the peak of their success and the point where according to the public, they stopped existing. While they were by no means split up or even unsigned for that matter, Sean Jay kept getting into trouble. While Smoke may have been the original bad boy in this duo, especially after kidnapping his alleged daughter, Sean kept getting into trouble, resulting in jail time and consequently no time to actually work on putting out music. The pair consistently traded off time in jail. Around 2007, Sean was arrested and charged with carrying a concealed weapon and resisting arrest. Almost two years later to the day, Sean was arrested in Florida after failing to show up at a court hearing to sort out the charges relating to cocaine and marijuana possession. The date was scheduled after another March arrest, in which he was also accused of carrying a concealed weapon. After skipping the hearing, it became apparent that Sean was no longer deeply invested in the duo and Smoke began trying to pursue a solo career. While the duo was supposed to release another album called Day Off The Week, the project was eventually shelved. Meanwhile, both musicians landed solo deals in addition to their group work. Smoke signed a deal with indie label Empire Records under the moniker Chevy P around 2008 while Sean was signed to his OG parent label Universal. Of the two rappers, Smoke or Chevy was the most successful, recording and scheduling an album for release around 2009 called Caprice Classics. One single was released called So Lonely but the album itself was eventually shelved. You don't cook, don't Sean, on the other hand, did not make it past his signing. Meanwhile, according to Smoke, Field Mob was still a thing and had not split up and according to the man, the jail time was the reason that Field Mob was suffering in terms of music. That's what it was. I went to jail, he went to jail. That's basically what it was. It was never a breakup. Fans continued to pray for another Field Mob album. However, that hope came crashing down around 2011 when Sean felt disrespected by a song that Ludacris dropped off his 1.21 gigawatts back to the first time mixtape titled Say It To My Face. You broken now you bitter, but how the hell is a nigga gonna stop beef with me on his fucking Twitter? According to Sean, Ludacris was not paying them for their biggest single, so what? This was the final straw for Sean who instantly began airing out his dirty laundry in interviews. I'm pretty sure for a fact he's talking about me on the, uh, saying to my fans, that bullshit. But it's crazy because I did that. I, I did that. Like, this shit, this shit don't hold no weight. But, I mean, we ain't never, you know, you gotta look at, like, when you, when you an artist and, you know, you're doing TV or whatever, I've been sitting at home before watching VT and I've seen So What Ringtone come up on Jamster commercial. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then, you know, we weren't getting them checks. So it kind of still left a sour taste in my mouth. And then it's just how the whole thing transpired with us anyway. We One minute we was cool as fuck, you know what I'm saying? I, I pretty much understand that's how DCP rock. They use you for whatever. When Luda ain't got no hit song, you know, they got damn milk you for your shit. And then they move on to the next project. And that's exactly what they did. He ain't pay me. I feel like he a fuck nigga. That's how I feel. I mean, I know they whole system. I have been around. I see how other artists got treated. You know what I'm saying? It's just like that. You do real fuck nigga shit. So I called him. In response to the perceived diss tracks, Sean dropped two diss tracks at Ludacris titled Pussy Boy and Stack a Million. You know I know you are Field Mob then promptly departed disturbing the peace and with it, the idea of Field Mob died. Bet it up. Now back to the DTP stuff. Were y'all ever able to kind of come to a head and get stuff squared away and back in order and you know no, rectify man, everything? Man, 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 they punks, man. Like what kind of man? Like, like, man, I don't believe him. I, don't, I, don't, I can't believe people believe people. Like, man, I hear on every record that Chris do, I hear him rap about how many records he sold, how much money he got. 
Well, why are you stealing from me? And you got all that money. Why you at, Luda? Why, where my checks at, man? Let me get some checks, man. Can I get some checks? I know about the black, but shot time out. I know about the black balling game too now. I know about everything that's been going on. I've recently been out there mingling around and I got to hear that certain people over there at y'all company told other people, no, nah, don't do this. Don't do this. We booked up. We get booked. That's one thing about it. You can't start that. I got a catalog that's crazy. People booked me to hear all I know. I did that without y'all. Sick of being lonely. I did that without y'all. Dead in the shit. I did that without y'all. I came over there with a name. I ain't get no name because I was with DTP now. We already came over there. If anything, my career went downhill when I went to DTP. But how can you fix a problem mm. when people take little shots at you? They take shots all the time. And I've been calling your name out. You can go Google mine. I did a quarter million on Worldstar in, in uh, three days. On a song about Chris. And I ain't lying not one time. Chris can't say my name in the record. And I understand that, Luda. I understand why you can't say my name. Because we already know what them bars like. And we already know how it's going to go, man. Toe for toe, boy. All that. Hit, hit. That ain't going to work with me, boy. But I'm on his ass like a birthmark, boy. I'm telling you that for real, boy. So what exactly happened to Sean and Smoke after the split? Sean continued with his narcotic-fueled antics and was arrested around 2016 in Houston. When quizzed by law officials, Sean gave the officers a false name and social security number because he had an outstanding warrant of arrest for possession of cocaine in Tallahassee, Florida. He was then arrested for possession of controlled substance, meth, and obstructing justice. He was also diagnosed with cancer and over the course of it had lost eyebrows, hair and teeth to the disease. He is unmarried but has at least two children, a son named Sean and a daughter named Kamiya that he posts about regularly on Instagram. Smoke on the other hand settled down to live a standard upper middle class life. He is the CEO of BLYKE Life and has at least three children. He was also in a 14 year long relationship with longtime girlfriend Alexia Adams and the duo took part in season 2 of the reality TV show Put a Ring on It around 2021. Smoke and Alexia had just moved in together and they decided to see if they could finally make it work permanently. Smoke then started cheating with another woman named Kai, forcing him and Alexia to break up. Now as for Field Mob, they are still technically together. They dropped a mixtape called Brother to Brother around 2016 and a single with Jaw Raw around 2020 called Wakanda Forever. On Spotify, they have about half a million monthly listeners and their most listened to songs are So What, Sick of Being Lonely, Georgia, All I Know, and Project Dreams. I don't remember meeting my mom first and I don't remember my dad. My first memory of a human being, of being in a, 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 in a body. I remember my brother telling me, come on baby, come on baby. I never forget it. It's weird. I, 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 I remember that. I'm one of my favorite person ever. But here's the thing about your favorite people. My brother, I love my brother so much. I done fought for my brother before. Like fight. Fought a nigga because he's tried my brother. I'm that, I'm that brother. But lately I've been, I don't, I catch myself now speaking on fuck shit, bullshit, shit that I don't respect or shit that I don't like. I speak on it. That's, that's just who I am. I've been, I don't get to live a regular life like you. You get to live a regular life. You know what I'm saying? You get to live a regular fucking life. I don't. You know what I'm saying? I don't. I don't. So, mentally I'm ahead of a lot of people. So with my brother being my favorite person, to find out that he holds a grudge about some shit back in the days. And that's why he's so evil towards me. That's hurtful. Because he older than me. At first it was hurtful because I felt like, damn, you of all people should know. 
and should have reached the point where you like, you know what? I probably did shit to Sean too, but that's not how people think. Then I got my little brother, Carlo. Carlo is like my baby. Love him. Love him. He like my son. Don't give a fuck. When I get, when I come up, I always think of him. I always try to find a way to do something for him. You know what I'm saying? He's my little brother. So when you don't get to talk to your brothers, my mama, I'm not going to really speak of my mama because at the end of the day, she my mama. Like I used to hold grudges against my family because they, when I was going through the first initial cancer shit, they weren't fucking with me. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I almost died and they just weren't fucking with me. And then my mama told me recently she just didn't know what to do. I can't call my mama. If I ain't got nowhere to stay, I can't go to my mama house and say, let me stay with her. Why? Because last time I was at my mama house, the, the, my tumor ruptured in my stomach and I almost died. And my mama told me I might have to get out because I was sitting in the bathroom. Begging, laying on, the, laying on the bathroom floor, screaming, begging her for help. I'm never going to forget that day, man. And I hate holding on to shit because I try to let everything go. Man, listen. Even now when I say it, it do something to me because I never, I never, I, that was the last time I was scared of death. I, I never be, I was scared I was dying. I thought I was dying. All I wanted was my motherfucking mama. All I wanted was my mama. I, I ain't care what she did. I don't know what she was supposed to do. I don't care. I just wanted my mama, right? And my mama looked at me and said, she came in and said, shh. You're going to wake up everybody. I'm about to tell you to leave. On oh, my soul, I crawled. Stood up on the wall, crawled out my mama's house. I ain't been back since. That's it for me, it's your boy Ali. What happened to Field Mob in your opinion? Let me know down below. Video requests, be sure to let me know down below as well. Also, add me on Instagram at Ali Talks Music. Till next time, peace. Perfect.